So hi, welcome. I'm Mandy Rose, Director of UE Bristol's Digital Cultures Research Centre, and you know, welcome to um, this event. And uh, Jonathan Gross will shortly be giving his lecture, Growth of What? New Narratives of Creative Economy. So this is the second of four summer seminars to mark a reconfiguration within the Research Centre around four themes. These are Restorative free Futures, led by Teresa Dillon, uh, Evolving Media, which I lead on, Screen Business and Screen Cultures, led by Andrew Spicer, um, and the theme of today's seminar, Creative Economies, led by John Doby. So these summer seminars are fortnightly. Um, we've had one already, and we've got two still to come. On July the 14th, uh, the Restorative Futures Seminar will be mold, um, uh, a lecture by Anthony Powers, uh, Becca Volker and Jeremy Till on the premises of future architectures. July 21st, Evolving Media will be Donna Hancock's on transmedia storytelling through place, pervasive, ambient and situated. So for tickets for these events, look at our website or our Twitter feed at DCRC uh, UK. So um, I'm going to hand in a moment to Simon Morton, who will chair this evening's event, but just a little background on Simon. Simon's a geographer uh, by background whose research looks at how political agency is ascribed to the concept of creativity and how such critique might generate more equitable conditions for cultural and creative work. Simon is currently co-investigator on the AHRC funded Bristol and Bath Creative R&D Cluster Programme. He's chair of the National AHRC Monitoring and Evidence Working Group, and he's leading work around creative ecosystems and inclusive economies as part of the UKRI Strength in Places My World program, which is led by the University of Bristol. Um, in another life, and I'm not quite sure where Simon finds the time, he's also author of Where, Life and Death in the Shropshire Hills, um, just published. It's an extraordinary multimodal memoir um, that's been published by Little Toller Books, which I would highly recommend, um, centering on Simon's prose and also his drawings and photographs and other archival materials. So highly recommend this. Uh, but, but now I'm going to hand over to Simon to chair this evening's event. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I wasn't necessarily expecting a plug, although Mandy did warn me briefly, but that's very kind of you. Thank you. So hello, everybody, and, um, and welcome. And thank you for coming along to see um, Jonathan speak. Um, as Mandy says, I am um, a senior research fellow, oh, pardon me, a senior research fellow, I'm just me desk, here at, um, at UE Bristol. And um, alongside working in, in the kind of the, the projects the man is outlined, I'm also part of a kind of a bit of the DCRC, um, which we call the Creative Economies Lab. And the point of that space is, um, as well as running programmes like Bristol and Path Creative R&D, it's, um, it's kind of a space for supporting R&D and innovation in the creative sector more broadly and trying to understand through the programmes and the projects that we do, how we can make that kind of sector more inclusive, more resilient, more stable, or we can learn about creativity and cultural activity um, and its value beyond the economic particularly. Um, and it's that kind of lens that has led us um, particularly recently to do another bit of work, which I'm gonna plug here as well, which is called um, which is our Hopeful Futures Network. And this is a new seminar series that um, kicks off tomorrow at 2 p.m. and will run across the rest of the calendar year. And this is exploring different ways of approaching and understanding um, the future in the face of various kind of challenges, climate change, um, social justice, inequalities, um, automation, and the many different things we have to think about if we want to really kind of try and build a better future for ourselves and for our descendants. So that kicks off soon. I'll put a link in the chat once we get going so people can kind of look at that. And again, those, those events are free um, to look at as well. And we started organising those, um, those ideas on this basis that there was a lot of people doing work that we weren't necessarily connected to, that were thinking about different ways of understanding value, different ways of understanding economy, different ways of understanding practice. And a lot of this work was happening outside of the creative economy. 
But we also knew that some of that stuff was happening within um, our particular sphere of research and interest. And I was involved, as with Jonathan, in a um, programme called the Pathways Beyond Economic Growth seminar series, which ran until recently. And, um, and it was there that I first saw Jonathan give this talk. And I thought it was a, a really wonderful, succinct and um, accessible way of understanding some of the challenges we face when we're trying to understand what a creative economy is or could be, when we're trying to understand what growth or what development could mean. And those themes have become particularly kind of important, important to us. So by way of introduction, uh, Jonathan is a lecturer in culture, media and creative industries at King's College London. Um, his research um, addresses various different things. It's kind of a, it's sort of a, and a really interesting thing to see in the different kind of spaces. And he touched on it in, the, in these talks, which is really wonderful. But cultural policy, participation, and politics from a variety of perspectives. Um, his recent publications uh, address topics including the history of the UK creative industries um, and the the um, the oral history of the creative industries mapping document um, is particularly excellent. I was reading that last night as well. Um, as well as cultural democracy, democracy and cultural politics of hope as well. So it kind of um, covers a broad set of themes. And actually this talk kind of speaks to a lot of those kind of interests that he has. Um, his current projects include developing inclusive and sustainable creative economies, which is the European Commission Horizon 2020 project in collaboration with colleagues at King's and at the University of Finland, Italy and Latvia. And in fact, I think we put that deep show for sure. And that's a really interesting kind of project. Um, it's very broadly looking at a number of the themes that we will touch upon this evening. So without further ado, I am going to shut up and very happily hand over to Jonathan uh, for today's talk. Thank over you. to you. Thanks so much, Simon. Thank you for uh, inviting me. And I'm very pleased to be here and um, really enjoyed. I'm back. I'm back. I was just um, just commenting on how much I'd enjoyed the jazz and your book uh, where Simon looks wonderful as well. So um, lovely ways to begin the session. I'm just going to share my uh, slides with you now. Hopefully that is all visible to you. So in this presentation, I'm essentially making one single point, which is that if we are to think beyond GDP growth as the measure of success in the creative economy, we need to understand what has been powerful about GDP, what has made it such an enduring number. And I'm gonna explore that in terms of narrative, GDP's ability to set the terms of storytelling politically and in policy domains. So I'm gonna come at this from a number of different angles, uh, drawing on two or three of my own uh, pieces of research, as well as uh, from a range of different literature that helps me make this argument. And I'm gonna begin by looking at this foundational moment of the creative industries that Simon's just alluded to, the mapping document of DCMS in 1998, just to give a brief sense of the storytelling function uh, of, um, of that document in the context of the GDP uh, framework. And then I'm going to say something about the criticisms that have been made about GDP, but then make this point that it kind of continues to march on despite all of those criticisms that have been made of it. And uh, the case that I'm making is that it's its um, storytelling power that enables it to do that and, and in the third section explore what some of our options could be perhaps for telling new stories of the creative economy for the creative economy beyond gdp growth so the birth of the creative industries a story of growth so um as simon mentioned i conducted an oral history of the 1998 Creative Industries Mapping Document. So I interviewed members of the New Labour Task Force who commissioned um, this piece of work, which defined the creative industries and mapped them for the first time and held a witness seminar, which you can see photographed here, which is a bit like the radio show on Radio 4, uh, The Reunion, where people come back to discuss a significant political event on, on the record. 
and we asked three questions. Why was the mapping document created? How was it created? And what were the consequences? And I just want to focus on this single point. So you can see David Putnam, the film producer and Labour peer at the top, and John Newbegin, the um, special advisor to Chris Smith, um, the first uh, Labour um, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. And, and they were both centrally involved in this process. And here, um, David Putnam is explaining why the mapping document was created. He says, it emerged from the fact that we found ourselves desperately ignorant. We had two problems. How should you define the creative economy and then trying to put a number on actually what it was worth? We needed a starting point. We needed to know what we were talking about. We agreed at the time that we do a second one in five years. We needed a, a direction of travel. We needed to know where we were in order to be sure where we were going and whether we were heading in the right direction. Once you defined a sector, once you've mapped out what its growth is, then that allows you to start prioritizing different areas of policy development. So just to reiterate, the point that I'm drawing out here is the storytelling function of this number of contribution to GDP. Where are we in year zero? Where are we in year five? What does that tell policymakers about the significance of our sector and how can we uh, leverage um, policy interventions and maybe investments on that, on that basis? So this obviously raises the question of whose attention is being sought for what purposes uh, is it Treasury? Is it other parts of government? Is it local government rather than central government? Is it not government at all? Who is this story looking to impress? And we could also follow Rebecca Solnit, the cultural historian and activist, in asking the question, whose story actually is this? If social and political life is structured by narratives, whose narratives are these? She writes, we live inside ideas. Some are shelters, some are observatories, some are windowless prisons. So we might pose that to GDP. Is GDP as a kind of a narrative structure of growth or recession? Is that a shelter as an idea? Is it an observatory? Does it help us see the world better or is it a kind of a prison? Let's have a think about critiques of GDP and yet the way in which it continues to uh, march on. So um, these ideas will be very familiar to all of you, the kind of wide range of critiques that have been made of the creative economy, the cultural and creative industries in terms of um, the non-equitable uh, conditions of work within these areas of the economy. So creative economy might, might be growing, might be going great guns at that level of contribution to the national economy, but it can be doing all kinds of violence to the workers within it. So that's left out of this story. And it can also be the case that the creative economy is growing according to the narrative framework of GDP, but is doing another kind of violence, which is, um, spreading precarity across the economy as a whole. So this is Angela McRobbie's powerful argument in Be Creative, that the creative economy is the thin edge of a neoliberal wedge through which people are invited to embrace their precarity. And then the creative economy might be growing, but it might be doing damage to the Earth's natural systems. So um, Kate Oakley and Mark Banks published an um, edited volume on, on this theme last year, and they strongly argue that too often the creative economy overestimates its green credentials. And then I'm particularly interested in Mark Banks's argument in uh, an article in Cultural Trends called Refuturing Creative Economy. His argument that um, current modes of thinking about creative growth foreclose the imagination. So he writes, most creative economy thinking betrays an utter failure of the cultural imagination, which I think very much speaks to your um, seminar series on, on the future and hopeful futures. I don't know if any of you have seen Mark Banks present this work. He often has a, a photo of a person on their own wearing a virtual reality headset, sort of grasping slightly uncontrolled 
in a slightly uncontrolled fashion. And he sort of uses this as a metaphor of a very kind of limited relationship between current creative economy, storytelling and the future. There could be very uh, different ways of, of thinking about the role of the creative economy in, in the future. So those are some of the critiques of uh, GDP and, and limitations of this uh, narrative framework as I'm presenting it um, from a range of writers to which others could be added. But of course, there's critique of GDP uh, outside of creative economy literature. So for example, uh, the influential work of Tim Jackson and Kate Rayworth, thinking about uh, planetary limits and the damage that GDP growth does to the Earth's natural systems. But then there are also challenges um, conceptually. So um, if GDP, and I'll come to its history in a moment, uh, was initially um, not intended to be a measure of prosperity, it is now taken in much political discourse to be an indicator of prosperity in the sense of things being well overall, the economy doing well overall. So there are conceptual challenges to be made as to whether or not GDP actually represents what it's used to represent, as well as methodological uh, criticisms. So in uh, David Pilling's book, for example, he notes that in the 1990s, Nigeria um, redid its method for calculating uh, its GDP and like the number went up 40%. So even the number itself can be very unreliable in many instances. And then there are all of the political critiques of GDP. So for example, Skidelsky and Skidelsky in their book, um, How Much Is Enough? They argue that the kind of hegemonic role of GDP has had a kind of anti-political function. In other words, it's excluded debates about the good life. If GDP is rising, things are going well, we don't need to ask difficult questions about what it means for us to collectively prosper. We could also think about the politics of care, which I'll say more about in a few minutes. Um, Joan Tronto's influential work on care, where she argues that the project of democracy is incomplete unless we think about the distribution of care. And similarly, we can't say that an economy is doing well if it systematically excludes the question of care. So let's think a little bit about the history of GDP in order to sort of denaturalize it, if you like. And I think it's, it's both uh, useful and a little bit fun just to note the etymology of statistics from uh, the German statistic, from New Latin statisticum of the state, an Italian statista, statesman or politician. The word statistic was introduced in 1749 by Gottfried Achenwald, originally designating the analysis of data about the state. So we could argue that GDP is the kind of epitome of a statistic in the sense that it's a number that serves the purpose of the state. And Diane Coyle traces this history in GDP, a brief but affectionate history, in which she indicates there were attempts in the 19th, 18th centuries to um, calculate national income and um, Mariana Mazzucato in her book, The Value of Everything, explores the question of the production boundary. What counts as productive activity that should be included within uh, national accounts and what is not productive? So famously, feminists have pointed towards uh, domestic work as not counted as productive within this kind of uh, calculation. But it was really, um, so yeah, the question of the production boundary was a hot topic in the, in the 19th and in the 18th centuries, but it was really um, in the 1930s and into the 1940s that GDP, as we've come to know it, got, got formulated. And Coyle argues that it was in response to these uh, two great uh, events, the Great Depression and World War II, that the impetus for um, developing GDP happened in order to enable policy interventions Policymakers wanted to be able to demonstrate both that the interventions of the New Deal were working and also to make the case uh, for investment um, to be able to produce the weapons to fight the wars that were on the horizon. So that's, that's her account of the kind of specific context in which GDP was formulated. But I'm about to show you a quotation from um, 
Simon Kuznets, uh, one of the economists chiefly responsible for formulating GDP. And uh, this quotation makes clear that it was highly contested what should be counted and whether or not only things that were deemed conducive to the collective good, collective welfare, should be included. So he wrote in 1937, it would be of great value to have national income estimates that would remove from the total elements, remove from the total elements which, from the standpoint of a more enlightened social philosophy than that of an acquisitive society, represent disservice rather than service. Such estimates would subtract from the present income totals, all expenses on armament, most of the outlays on advertising, a great many expenses involved in financial and speculative activities. So in other words, the economists most centrally responsible for developing GDP thought that arms sales, advertising and financial services shouldn't be counted and could even be detracted from GDP totals. So I think this is a, a really interesting kind of foundational moment to recognize that um, GDP was contested in terms of a more, a more limited calculation serving more limited functions, not intended to be a comprehensive measure of, of economic activity, and definitely not intended to be a proxy for prosperity. Nonetheless, it continues to have enormous power, as, as we know, and um, Diane Coyle sort of makes the argument that GDP made possible modern macroeconomics as we know it, made possible kinds of pictures of the economy that in turn made possible certain kinds of policy intervention that we know as Keynesianism. So it had, it had real uh, consequence, Coyle argues, for policymaking. Um, and as we know, it has continued to um, play a dominant role within policymaking. And I want to just sort of make, make the case um, that it's its simplicity in structuring narrative that has helped it uh, to maintain that position. So if we compare this kind of curve of upward GDP growth on the left to, um, to donut economics of Kate Rayworth on the, on the right, um, I would sort of pose the question, you know, which of these two images tells the more kind of simple and compelling story uh, of what the economy is doing. So I'm very sympathetic to Rayworth's work and I think it's extremely important and consequential work. She, she is very interested in the images, uh, the diagrams that are used to represent uh, economics. And that's part of the discussion of that book to come up with a new, a new image, a new diagram. Um, but I'm not sure about the, the donut in terms of its political efficacy as an image, as a, as a storytelling device, but I'd be interested to hear what other people think. So um, GDP, despite its limitations, despite the critiques that have been made of it, continues to exert narrative power. Um, and as one uh, economist puts it, um, economics is the mother tongue uh, of public policy and, and, and GDP is the, is the key story that it, that it speaks. Um, but let's have a think about if we took seriously the need to tell new stories, what would it be that we're growing? Or perhaps some of you might think that we could tell stories that don't involve growth at all. But let's think about what, what might a different story of growth be that isn't growing GDP? So one set of ideas that I've been interested in for a few years is the capability approach or the capability and human development approach as it's sometimes called. So I've used this idea in the context of cultural policy and cultural participation in particular, in terms of developing a new account of cultural opportunity, not as the opportunity just to access publicly funded arts and cultural organizations, but to have an expansive range of cultural capabilities or cultural freedoms. Um, so see the um, Towards Cultural Democracy report, for example, um, that I published with Nick Wilson and, and Anna Bull. But just to say something about what the capability approach is, some of you may well be very familiar with it already, 
So um, initially developed by Amartya Sen, the economist working within the space of development economics in this case, proposing that rather than uh, money being the indicator of, uh, of prosperity, it should be uh, freedom, but a specific account of freedom, capabilities, freedoms grounded in material conditions. So capabilities are um, the beings and doings that people have reason to value. So what, are the, what kinds of lives do people choose to live? What, what does a good life mean to people? That's a central question within the capabilities approach. So capabilities are freedoms that could include everything from uh, the freedom to vote, the freedom to access healthcare, freedom of expression, um, the freedom to access uh, education. Freedoms can um, be of many kinds. And in this sense, it's an explicitly multi-dimensional account of prosperity, of well-being, of advantage and disadvantage and of justice. So for example, so uh, to make the same point in a different, in a different way, you can't uh, know if someone is doing well, if they have well-being just on the basis of their income. You need to know about the capabilities open to them. And Sen in particular emphasizes that the capabilities that matter within the evaluation of a policy or within the assessment as to whether a government is meeting the needs of its people and whether it's a just government, the, the, the capabilities that matter should be decided via deliberation by the people affected. So he strongly uh, emphasizes participation and deliberation in the naming of capabilities. But other writers within this uh, modern tradition, let's call it, including Martha Nussbaum, take a different view. And, and Nussbaum has a list of 10 core capabilities that every government should guarantee to its people. So if we take Sen's approach, it really does raise questions of scale. If you're, if you're interested in particular populations, naming the capabilities that matter, how would you scale that up into, let's say, a capabilities index that could be used in different locations? There's a significant tension there that um, is, is difficult to resolve. So the capability approach rethinks prosperity. And um, for those who are interested in reading more about this, Ingrid Robain's book here, Wellbeing, Freedom and Social Justice, is a really excellent kind of survey of the, of the field. And she sort of indicates that some academic fields, including um, development economics itself, have been transformed by the capabilities approach. And other fields, including sort of mainstream economics, if you like, have been untouched by it. But it has had significant uh, policy impact. It, it's, the, it's the intellectual underpinning of the Human Development Index that celebrated its 30-year uh, uh, anniversary this year, published by the, by the UN each year since then. Um, but Robbins makes the point that it's kind of intuitively easy to grasp that it's about uh, the expansion of capability. So if we go back to this slide, development is freedom. I think that's a clear story. We could be we could be telling that story that the development isn't about GDP growth, it's about the expansion of freedom. But there's tremendous complexity underneath that story. Um, and that's part of the challenge of using the capabilities of approach, holding together that simple story with the kind of complexity that's involved in naming the capabilities that matter and if necessary, measuring them. So, um, just to locate some of those ideas within uh, the project that Simon mentioned, Diche, Developing Inclusive and Sustainable Creative Economies. This is a, a collaboration between researchers at King's, uh, the University of Turku in Finland, uh, GSSI in Italy, and the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, as well as Trans Europe Hals Network of Independent Cultural Organizations and the Cultural Media Agency, Kumede. And we are looking at 10 small and medium sized cities across Europe and thinking about what um, inclusivity and sustainability means within the creative economies of those locations. And the King's team is very much using the capabilities approach in this work. We're doing field work in Dundee, pictured here with its VNA, and also in Chatham in Kent. And we've sort of collaborated with the other research teams in Enschede in the Netherlands. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make one 
um, illustration of the ways in which we're expanding uh, the story that might be told about what the creative economy is and what it's for. So this is just one example from uh, Dundee, which is an organization called Creative Dundee, which was initiated by one person, Gillian Eason, about uh, a decade ago as a blog that she wrote in order to give visibility to the creative life of the city that she felt wasn't getting the recognition that it deserved and in order to facilitate greater sort of um, collaboration, she then started uh, networking events, Petra Kutcher nights, uh, et cetera, which you can see uh, photographed here and this sort of image of connections being made. And um, I treat it as a, an example here for the slight pivot in mission or the slight expansion in mission that Creative Dundee has undertaken during COVID. So this is We Dundee, that they, uh, a web space that they created to reimagine what happens next beyond COVID within Dundee. So any citizen of Dundee could suggest ideas. So you can see some of them written here. Engage the schemes in the cultural development of Dundee. Art of the people, by the people, for the people, etc. More assistance that enables small businesses to open and flourish, etc. So they created a space in which the people of Dundee could imagine the future of the city. And I want to argue that this is a practice of care. This can be understood as creative Dundee practicing a form of creative care. So Joan Tronto, who uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, characterizes care as having four components. Paying attention, paying attention to people's needs, taking responsibility for meeting those needs, doing so with skill. So for example, someone needs a cup of tea, you take responsibility for making them a cup of tea, but you spill the hot tea on them. That's not care, skill is required. And then responsiveness, giving space for people to say, were their needs met? So that's the kind of process of care as Toronto characterizes it. And I would argue, as I've argued with my colleagues, that Creative Dundee has recognized a need, a new need, which is to imagine the future beyond COVID. They've taken responsibility for meeting that need with particular skills that they have for creative digital facilitation. And, um, responsiveness is uh, is inbuilt to this process um, in terms of soliciting input from the good people of of Dundee so we can we can ask the question what is the role of the creative economy within the context of um, the crisis of care that preceded covid and has only been made more visible by covid so the care manifesto by the care collective was largely written before the pandemic, but published just after, and has garnered plenty of attention now published in, in several languages. We've obviously been clapping for uh, professional carers, whilst we can recognize all of the um, everyday forms of care that also go unrecognized. Within that kind of new story of the economy, you know, the Care Manifesto calls for a caring economy across scale. We can ask the question, what is the role of the creative economy? How might organizations like Creative Dundee not just connect up creative industries, organizations and workers, but maybe create new kinds of civic space perhaps that meet collective needs in creative ways? That's the kind of thing we're thinking about in the context of Fiche. And we're using the capabilities approach and we've set ourselves the challenge of developing a multi-dimensional capabilities index and um, we're only uh, part way through that process we're sort of um, naming three sort of spaces of capabilities capabilities of experience so what kinds of experiences uh, are available to people creatively within their city through different kinds of uh, creative participation what capabilities of project development do people have through developing a creative career or through voluntary projects? And then what capabilities of creative governance, actually taking decisions are open to people? So we're just naming those three spaces of capabilities. And then, then in the autumn, we're gonna go back to our 10 cities where we've done the field work and um, have participatory workshops to kind of invite people to name the capabilities that they think should matter 
at a collective level for the city so that that would be the way of collectively determining what progress looks like when those specific capabilities are expanded within the city. So it's a kind of, in the first instance, it's a tool for deliberation. And then we're faced with the kind of technical challenges as to how to operationalize it. And we're not really um, that far along yet in that part of our work on it, but that's, that's to come over the next um, part of the project. But as I mentioned earlier, the capabilities approach, if you take this kind of deliberative participatory uh, version of the capabilities approach, it does pose questions of scale. And this is part of the power of GDP, that it can coalesce into a single number, the enormous range of economic activities that take place. So that's, that's part of the challenge. How do you tell that kind of clarity of um, numerical storytelling how do you achieve that kind of clarity of numerical storytelling uh, that can compete with, with GDP? It's, it is a big challenge, um, but I also want to flag that it's a challenge that we can think about in terms of bigger political stories. So Chang writes that economics is inseparable from the politics of ideas and you know, link that back to Solnit in terms of what are the ideas that we, that we live within. And you know, plenty of writers have thought about politics as a practice of storytelling. You could use different kind of theoretical uh, languages to do so from uh, uh, hegemony uh, downwards, if you like. Uh, what is the kind of common sense, the kind of taken for granted story of who we are and what we're about. Uh, I, I enjoyed Jeremy sorry, George Monbiot's book, Out of the Wreckage, where he, he argues that neoliberalism and um, uh, neoliberalism met its kind of end in some sense with the financial crisis and uh, another end in the ongoing crisis of climate change. So we need a new political story to replace it. And he offers a story of what he calls belonging. Um, but there are many other sort of stories that we could tell, and I'm going to come on to the Green New Deal in my next uh, next slide. But one of the things that I've written about recently in the European Journal of Cultural Studies is the kind of question of, well, who tells the stories that become common sense? Where do these stories emerge from? And I kind of pose that question in the context of build back better and um, uh, what I kind of refer to as um, spaces of political imagination in the context of needing to tell new stories post covid who narrates what it means to build back better where do those stories get told do they get told online do they get told in westminster maybe they get told in cultural and creative organizations who gets to tell those stories um obviously um these are these are big political questions and um I think they, they relate to your series again in terms of hopeful futures. Where do, where do the um, hopeful narratives of the future arise from? Rebecca Solnit's book, just by the way, Hope in the Dark, is very, very interesting on that. She sort of shows how various kind of progressive achievements, activist achievements, sort of start sort of in the wings of history and then enter into the mainstream. So we could be thinking about what are the spaces from which the new stories uh, get told uh, and what kinds of practices would help in formulating new normative commitments, new accounts of what progress looks like. So I can share a link to that piece if you're interested in that. So um, just in my kind of penultimate slide before wrapping up, um, another kind of story that we could tell beyond GDP could be the Green New Deal. So I've, I've, I've spoken about a new politics of care, the Care Manifesto argues that care should be made central to our political storytelling. We might think about the Green New Deal as an alternative story and ask the question, what role could creative economy have within the Green New Deal? I've written a little bit about the role of cultural policy potentially within the Green New Deal. So writers on the Green New Deal refer to it as a infrastructural revolution, a revolution in transport, energy and communication infrastructure. So in that piece with Nick Wilson, we discussed the idea of cultural infrastructure. So Eric Klinenberg 
uses the idea of social infrastructure as those spaces and places in which relationships are formed. So that can be everything from libraries to shops to parks, etc. So we argue that cultural infrastructure is a kind of a subcategory of social infrastructure in which relationships are formed and new stories are told through particular kind of um, concentrations of, of creative practice. And Naomi Klein and others argue that if the Green New Deal is to succeed, it will need so much social energy behind it because it will face so many vested interests um, um, that um, activism will be necessary, social movements will be necessary. And we kind of argue in, in that piece, you know, that cultural uh, infrastructure has a role to play um, the kind of civic spaces in which relationships could be formed behind a project of the Green New Deal. So that's a that's another kind of think piece, if you like, opening up the question of what could the role of, uh, of cultural policy specifically be within the Green New Deal. But we could ask the question, what could the role of creative economy be within that big story? So just to just to wrap up, I've kind of made six points that accounts of the cultural and creative industries and the creative economy have been articulated in close relation to GDP growth since uh, 1998 onwards. So that kind of frame of storytelling was established and we can see it in newspaper reports and industry reports all the time that um, the creative economy is the fastest or the second fastest sector of the economy and has grown by X, Y or Z, et cetera, et cetera. And this is my, my second and sort of central point that part of the power of GDP has been precisely its ability to support narratives. And in order to go beyond GDP as that kind of hegemonic framing, we need to think about new stories. And I've touched on two uh, or three actually, the um, development as freedom, capability expansion, also uh, the, 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 the care manifesto as an alternative story of economics and politics, which is about the expansion of care, and then the Green New Deal. So how might creative economy align itself, make itself useful to understand itself in relationship to those kinds of uh, big political stories? Um, I've also sort of highlighted this kind of challenge that narrative frameworks beyond GDP raise questions of scale. Like I say, GDP is so good at um, uh, aggregating vast amounts of activity. There's a big challenge for how to do that through these different frameworks in a comparatively powerful way. But I also want to flag up at the end here that as well as conceptual and technical challenges, this is a question of political commitment and strategy. So do we want to commit to the Green New Deal? Um, that might be part of, what, of what's needed in order to tell a new story of the creative economy. Um, and we might uh, sort of finish by just sort of touching on the fact that beyond economic growth or beyond GDP also involves telling new stories of economics itself. So um, uh, embedding care within what we understand the economy to be, for example. Um, whereas previously it was it was ignored in so many different ways. So we need to we need to not abandon economics, but reclaim it um, uh, in in a more expanded understanding. So I'll just leave it there, and um, yeah, I really look forward to hearing how some of these ideas land with uh, with the work that you're all doing. So thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much. That was, um, uh, it's, yeah, as, as I think I said in my introduction, such a kind of a logical and clear kind of attempt to step through some quite big and complicated kind of moments in the um, in the kind of development of some quite big ideas, um, uh, particularly on the kind of the, the constitution of, of, of GDP as an idea. And I think, you know, this is something that, that, that struck me as, um, uh, Surprising, although it probably shouldn't have been, but the kind of the, the level at which um, it was so GDP was so particularly contingent. I think that idea that um, that idea that actually it was originally intended or suggested that those things which were perhaps morally, um, should we say, um, um, questionable 
within within the kind of economic sphere wouldn't necessarily be captured in that kind of, in, 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 in that GDP and that should be how how you know there's that kind of thing about how, how numbers very quickly become um truths incontrovertible truths um when actually that that isn't necessarily the case so thank you so much for kind of running running through that all for us um so questions are starting to come in in the q a bit there but um while i was giving people uh, an opportunity to do that i thought i might ask you a couple of uh, things using my chair's prerogative really um, and one of the things that i was thinking about was about my first question, I guess, was about kind of thinking about capabilities. And that is a very kind of attractive, very interesting kind of way of thinking about things. And, and the way that you were applying that to that particular project or that particular kind of initiative in, in Dundee and working through those kinds of questions about how that, um, that happened. Is that something that you've been thinking about offering for other organisations or projects that it actually becomes a kind of a toolkit um, that you, you might develop? Because I was thinking, you know, as we head into the, the evaluation of um, Bristol and Bath Creative idea of the next couple of years, what kind of central tenets we might take away as evaluators from, from your approach that we might want to kind of think about in relation to those that scale of activity, let's say, rather than the macro scale. We can come back to that perhaps later, but, but that kind of that scale. Yeah, I think there are there are a bunch of different ways that you can use the capabilities uh, approach in, in, in different contexts. So in the context of DSHA, um, you know, we will analyze uh, the data, partly in terms of the valuable capabilities that people name for themselves in our interviews. So what are the kinds of skills and freedoms that matter to them in developing their creative careers, for example? So you can, you can pay attention to the capabilities that already matter to people, rather than perhaps, you know, the kinds of uh, opportunities that a policymaker might presume. So, in that sense, we're paying attention to the capabilities that, that people identify that matter to them in narrating their careers in an interview, but also in the workshops. So creating that space in which people um, can name, like, well, what are, the, what are the freedoms, what are the opportunities that would matter to you? Um, and making those the evaluative space of policy. In, in, terms, of, in terms of how you would then take that back into individual organisations, we're not at the stage of doing that yet, but I wonder whether, I guess there could be two different, there could be different sort of kinds of toolkit in this space. Some of them could be like a toolkit for asking the question, what are the capabilities that matter to your organization? Um, as opposed to sort of uh, naming those capabilities in advance for them. Um, but I guess the capabilities approach sort of um, emphasizes freedoms and opportunities and the conditions that makes it possible to for people to exercise freedoms rather than a sort of um just measuring outcomes if you like so in that sense uh um i think it does offer something distinctive mm -hmm. yeah and i think that that also makes me think about how many of the kind of the ways in which we think differently about so uh, an, an economy not necessarily the, the financial economy, but an, an economy of exchange and an economy of, um, I guess, an, of experience. I don't mean experience economy, that's going to be different, but in the sense that even the, the conducting of the conversation and the identifying of those capabilities is in fact of value and producing the capabilities in and of itself. So they, it produces in its production of, I guess, what you might call an output, it is productive in itself, which is, I think, um, really interesting and also quite challenging to um to find a language for i think to find a language for when you know i certainly know that when we say in relation to the projects that we do that particular participants um develop a particular set of skills or experiences or aptitudes or or, or confidence or you know any number of these kinds of intangibles which sometimes get called transferable skills in a different kind of intellectual space but but actually people go well that's really interesting that they've experienced that thing but what's the what's the number <laughs> you know what's the, what does yeah. the number mean and it's that embeddedness of number isn't it that, that that takes us up those scales and i think you illustrate that really nicely about the sense that almost the further the further you get from the locus of activity and production the more abstracted it becomes the clearer it is to have a single um, a single piece of knowledge which acts as that as that kind of indicator which is yeah 
So I, was just, I guess I was just wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about that complexity of that, that process as you go up the scale of um, abstraction, shall we say, yeah. towards a moment where you want to kind of say something very clear um, and whether actually we can do that or whether we actually have to have a wholesale reimagining from the ground up that we no longer expect that kind of objective clarity or falsely objective clarity of the single number. Yeah. Um, so, as I said, we, we haven't sort of got to that stage of our own work, but I guess we can look to, you know, how does the UN um, Human Development Index do it? You know, it committed itself originally to sort of three indicators. It could have been more, but it thought that three would be sort of better than the one of GDP, but not too many. And then, you know, uh, in one of our literature reviews, we kind of go through various other indicators and how they do their processes of aggregation. So there are there are examples um, out there of, of attempting to aggregate in ways that don't do violence to the multiplicity that you're trying to you're trying to capture, I guess it's then a question of how you insert those numbers into different policy spaces. Um, so yeah, I mean, to mark the 30th anniversary of the UN um, Human Development Report, there were interesting conversations at the um, Human Development and Capabilities Association Conference about whether it had been a success or a, or a failure. And people had felt it was a success because it, it definitely expanded the space beyond GDP so that you know, intergovernmental organizations were paying attention to education and life expectancy. But then there was also a kind of sense that like, well, it hasn't gone far enough because that's not good enough as an assessment of what good lives look like. So there are compromises when you aggregate and I, I think that's unavoidable. Um, but I think, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a challenge that we should pose to creative economy, I guess, like what kind of modes of aggregation uh, would be better than GDP, but still be sort of politically efficacious. Yeah, and I'm very much minded of um, the work of the Thriving Places Network, um, who are based in Bristol, who I don't know if you've come across before, um, who used to be called the Happy Cities Initiative. And what they've actually done is they've created a, um, essentially an aggregation of existing data sets that places not just growth or economic growth as the kind of the indicator of well-being so they take in uh, account sort of um access to green space quality of air a number of other kinds of indicators of, of well-being and although this isn't necessarily a capability structure it kind of draws on that kind of sense of the multiplicity to kind of actually come up with a new um you know as a new machine to put your numbers into that still comes up with something that is that is um rationalistically objective from the point of view of those who, who reckon who, who imagine number as such and then they're able to kind of do that so that's quite interesting and, and one of and um liz seidler who runs that organization will be speaking next thursday i believe it is or no two weeks from the july the 15th sorry um as part of a part of our hope future network thing and that's really an interesting and uh, yeah an interesting kind of idea about that kind of sense of aggregation um so there's two questions we've got kind of coming in coming in from the audience and i'm going to step through them um now so one of the questions and i think this is interesting about in terms of how you translate to policy space um and thinking about the kind of the violence done by by um by, by kind of number and practice and so on and so forth which is one question which we have which is um um so you know, could this be, I guess, this kind of un be this kind of mode of conversation be understood as a, a response to the government's valuing culture and heritage capital framework, which are inviting research looking at alternative ways of measuring the value of culture. So I guess there is a big conversation about cultural value, um, which as we talk about the creative economies and we're talking about kind of in theories about industry and production, we may not necessarily, there's implicit got cultural value in it, but is there something that can be spoken to that kind of sector? Um, especially given its very distinct politics at the moment around heritage and heritage capital. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, um, I guess I guess one one way of me responding to this is to kind of come back to that question on one of the early slides in terms of like who are you looking to persuade. 
So, I mean, obviously that's part of, that's, that's long been part of the kind of cultural d value debate. Like what is, the, what is the assessment of value for? Who's it for? Um, and, um, and in a sense, is it, is it evaluation for, uh, for the sake of understanding what good practice is? Is it for the persuasion of policymakers? Um, I guess part of my interest is actually to kind of like look beyond the sector. So for example, having conversations within the DSHA team about what the relationship might be between that broader project of caring economy and creative economy. So in a sense, like um, um, looking, to, looking to persuade um, po political decision makers who might not even be thinking about funding arts and cultural and creative activity um, and um, seeing, seeing what happens to evaluation if you sort of turn outwards in, in that way. Um, I know that's a, a somewhat abstract response, but it's kind of part of how I'm thinking at, at, at the moment. Um, and I guess other, others have written about the kind of circularity of the cultural value debate, but for me, that would be one way of breaking out of it, to kind of turn to those broader kind of social and political projects and think, okay, like how can we help those rather than how can we help ourselves um, might be my way of thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that, that I maybe we'll return to in a moment is, is that that sense of the artificial boundedness of the creative industries and the things that are not the creative industries and so on. And that, that and how that kind of gives you a kind of a barrier in that, that kind of distinction space. Um, but to move on quickly, I just sort of wanted to think about um, uh, about another question we have here, which is which is around essentially how we make the, the move to participate in the social movements needed um, an inclusive and, and kind of productive space. So the question is like, you know, in order to harness huge energy and build capacity to develop to deliver new models, people need to put some different time in. While we're still in GDP-led world, time is money, and those who are most vulnerable and excluded currently will be the least able to participate. So how do we address that? Yeah, well, I guess um, we, could, we could look to sort of uh, big um, innovations within um, the relationship between the state, universal basic income, we could think about universal basic services, you know, those, those are the kinds of conversations that have been had for a few years now and obviously have accelerated in times of COVID, which, you know, um, one of the things that they do is potentially free up people in their relationship with time or the four day working week. Um, you know, more and more organizations becoming interested in the four day working week. Um, those, kinds of, those kinds of social policy our cultural policy, you know, in the to the extent to which they create more space for um, cultural and creative activity. So again, I guess it's sort of it's looking it's looking outwards in order to reframe the cultural and creative sectors. Yeah, I guess the the, the challenge is as well that if we the the as with all kinds of activism, I guess that if we are able to find ways in the interim before those kinds of policy changes can be made, then there's always going to be a, a, a certain extent of those of us in positions of influence, um, relative influence, and, and those of us not, how we, how we are committed to the capabilities and the voices of the people that we will end up inevitably representing. Because obviously, participation for many people is, I mean, that's kind of one of the ways in which capitalism operates, isn't it, is to kind of prevent particular kinds of politics operates to prevent the participation of the people who would benefit most from the participation and the, and the and the readjustment of the systems so i guess there's some sense that yeah how we if we can become stewards of other people's voices how we make sure that that kind of stuff happens and by we i mean obviously the position of um privilege within the university although not necessarily <laughs> um you know, maybe knocking on policy store, you know, but it's all relative, isn't it? And actually how we, how we might move towards that. I think that's the question is kind of thinking about that, but how we, how we ensure the voices are. Yeah. Um, held, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. I guess it, um, questions about like what modes of, what modes of representation operate, what modes of solidarity operate, um, 
you know, at, at one level, people can um, um, recognize recognize their power, recognize their their influence is sort of step one, isn't it? I mean, in the care manifesto, they 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 think across different scales, and they're interested in uh, mutual aid, for example. So new modes of solidarity are emerging. Obviously, mutual aid is um, uh, requires unpaid labour, but um, I guess I guess it's been interesting in the last eighteen months to see the modes of um, new modes of solidarity emerging within these within these contexts. And I guess learning from that experience can be part of um, part of what the future looks like as as well. New new modes of union working. What does it what does it mean to be a, a unionized academic? Um, how can we sort of expand solidarity within the institutions that we work within? How can we even, for example, uh, make use of the kind of imperatives to achieve research impact in ways that are um, genuinely expansive of the capabilities of, of broad populations? You know, if, if impact is invited, um, that's a space in which to work, isn't it? So. That could be one area to think about. Yeah, and I think that's something that I've, I've often thought about the impact agenda is, despite its, you know, its problematic political context, and then for anyone who's left in the audience who's not entirely aware, this is the, this is the way in which the state um, measures the influence, economic, social, cultural, or otherwise, our research has on communities beyond the research community. So when we're not just talking to each other, what happens out in the real world, outside of our open towers. Um, yeah, and obviously, you know, sorry to kind of put you on the spot there to try and solve the problem of hundreds of years of anarchist and, and, and kind of uh, um, um, kind of resistive thought about those things. But it is a really interesting thing and, and those responsibilities and where they lie and how we kind of, um, how we kind of pick those apart and kind of move, move, move those things on. So we've got another question in the chat. Um, so I am going to read this out. Um, so a decade or so ago, there was quite a compelling critique of GDP that arose from work, including Wilson and Pickett's spirit level, which arose from the idea that beyond a certain level of income, people don't get any happier. This critique was associated with Bhutan changing to gross national happiness. And I think there's something very similar happening in, in New Zealand or well-being being kind of positioned in a different space. I wonder where that work has gone as it seems to have potential for making a case beyond growth. Perhaps that is now in the Happy Cities Index. But this interests me as critique of GDP has potential for a wide critical purchase. So I guess, yeah, those, those sense of, um, yeah, kind of actually, because that was interesting about that one is that it directly attacks a particular culture around money, I guess, around acquisition as a means of kind of trying to unlock other kind of affective positions in the world. Um, but yes, do you know anything or have you kind of encountered those kinds of models and, and any um, idea I, where they went? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know enough about them to comment interestingly on them. I mean, I, I guess I'm interested in things, um, including in Wales, you know, they passed this, war, this law in terms of like, paying attention to the impact on future generations. So I think there, there can be like a cluster of high level policy framings, including a well-being index, but also that kind of law, which puts constraints on growth as the only kind of um, measure of success that you, that you might have a, like a, a combination of policy instruments that kind of expands the space of successful, uh, successful government. Um, but um, it's certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Iceland, New Zealand, it's interesting to kind of see that these, these real world examples are happening and to sort of see if they expand further. Yeah, I was, um, so another thing about, I run a scheme called the New Scholars Scheme, which is sort of for early career researchers and PhD students um, kind of working in, in this area, but the credit economy more broadly. And, we were having a discussion about um, about this kind of thing, and one of them, who's an academic based in Dundee, was saying that actually in Scotland, uh, part of the, um, the the devolved government has started kind of sort of just putting out some research, thinking about this question about what would it look like to do a um, to do one of these kind of sort of Iceland um, 
put, you know, New Zealand type models of kind of Scotland. And, and she was asking whether or not there was any equivalent um, coming from Westminster. And I think we all look very, very blank and thought, well, no. <laughs> and so you obviously hit the way in which you, you hit up against those kinds of particular political ideologies um, in the sense that what what you need to give ground to, to even start having the conversation. And I think that is something that, that I've been thinking about a lot in, in relation to our work in, in the region, because we, we get funded to do, um, to give money to the creative sector to help develop that so essentially economic agency of some kind. But we're often getting money on terms that aren't necessarily in, in line with what we do, what we want to see happen rather, I should say. So we have to both um, treat that money, the public money, um, properly, but we also have to make sure that we try and make that, make those cases slowly so that those those kind of sense of politics that aren't open to the conversation might start to do that. And I get the impression, um, maybe from what you said earlier about the kind of the build back better and the conversations we're having now, whether this actually, whether you think we actually have an opportunity now to start kind of um, impressing the, 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 the need for these kinds of conversations more than we did say pre pandemic. Because um, as we've said, you know, the, the pandemic actually just laid bare our existing frailties rather than necessarily, you know, um, invented them, should we say. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's obviously th challenged so many orthodoxies, hasn't it? Like that, that a conservative government could spend however many hundred billion pounds uh, overnight. Um, it, that, that opens up a whole set of space for what's possible at, at one level politically, um, and I guess there are there are also interesting questions <laughs> about like alongside Build Back Better, what the leveling up agenda constitutes. And I guess I'm interested in the extent to which leveling up involves devolution. To what extent will local populations be involved in naming what? Um, what happens in their in their areas and what the kind of political um, um, logics will be to the extent to which leveling up does does take place so obviously yeah de devolution brings with it the potential for creativity you know it's like we can do things differently so um yeah I think there are interesting questions about yeah the, that relationship the extent to which devolution does create spaces for political experimentation let's uh yeah let's watch that space yeah and uh, the way that and to kind of return to what you were saying early on about kind of looking outside of the sector looking outside of the creative economy and, and one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is, is kind of the sense of we've been framing it in kind of business language spillover but the sense actually that once you start to kind of use the kind of analysis you have which points out that um, terminology, number, boundaries, definitions for what we call the creative sector or the creative economy or the creative industry are in fact um, ideas made concrete in a particular social practice, number or whatever, and that actually they're not fixed things. And that if we're able to kind of unfix them and look at maybe what holds them in common that isn't, let's say the economic or, or a very simple set of practices, that you might be able to see where those overlaps happen with other kinds of spaces so hence you know how does the create how does a sense of kind of creative and cultural and social justice and inquiry coming from within a particular section of the, what we call the cultural creative sector actually affect um let's say um, engineering or circular economies in engineering and so on because we all stand to benefit from one another so i think that's kind of where we're going and i think it sounds like a similar kind of stuff that you're interested in as well which is if we if we find the right language to kind of say actually creativity really is everywhere but not so broadly vague that it that, that it means nothing but we can actually kind of get a purchase in other spaces that becomes very important i think yeah that's very nicely articulated I like, yes <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean who knows what we'll be able to kind of manage, manage with those, those kinds of thoughts um I was wondering if there's any more questions from those of us remaining in the audience we've got some uh some, some words of encouragement from Helen there. I think she's, this is kind of, uh, this is resonating with, with, with their work there um, as well. So, and then we'll just wait a second to anyone's going to type anything else. I mean, the other thing I've been thinking about really in relation to, 
um, these kinds of moments, these kinds of spaces, thinking about sort of, you know, um, devolution, the move towards localism or regionalism, and then the kind of whether or not, so the state seems to be pushing, particularly at the moment in our kind of innovation and R&D kind of sector, the thing we're getting the vibes from, from, from the treasury, from the state, is a kind of a real push towards net zero. So net carbon zero by a particular date. And actually one of the things about um, the limits to growth is that actually um, you simply cannot keep growing because it is not a sustainable activity. So at some point, if we're gonna to get to some kind of net zero space, that's gonna to have to challenge the predominance of growth as a model, one would imagine. So whether actually, you know, that that's gonna be a space where we start to see the need for a, um, you know, that there's some, there feels to me like something there where like they might be encouraging a particular kind of um, innovation and growth in a particular kind of sector to come up with, you know, carbon neutral technologies and practices, but actually that its ultimate success is going to be one that is, that's going to prevent economic growth and expansion in the way that we have seen it before. Do you think that's something that, that is the case? Do you think that's, you know, do you think that they are, I guess it's that environmental question, link between the environmental question and the, and the kind of, um, the violent question of GDP. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, Tim, Tim Jackson explores this in, in great detail in Prosperity Beyond Growth, like whether decoupling growth from carbon is, is possible and basically concludes that it's not really. So, so in, in that sense, in that sense um, if you're persuaded by his argumentation, then to achieve net zero, yeah, growth has to be, be, be reined in or... Um, so, um, but yes, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what the kind of political possibilities of that space look like. But if that's if that if that's a space you're sort of working in relation to, then I'd be interested to hear what you what you think. Like the kind of imperative towards uh, net zero makes possible politically. Mm. Yeah, that's something that we're kind of. I think that's the that's the that's the, the current whiff on the wind that we're getting is that that's something and so we're thinking that you know the work that, we're, that we'll do in the next few years is whether or not we can move towards thinking about those questions because at the moment we're kind of interested in it but we haven't done much work on it i haven't really connected with those people who are doing that kind of work and actually you know um how that kind of will connect together but it sounds like there's gonna be many more conversations to be had um i would think so i'm gonna say that if we haven't got any last minute um questions from the audience um, we have a comment come in from Helen not a question thank you very much Helen um, um, but yes so I guess it leaves me to say so um, Jonathan are your contact details available on your university web page yeah, if people want to get in touch and, and ask questions and things after today yeah please please do yeah so i'm yeah i'm jonathan.gross at kcl.ac.uk or yeah find my web page at king's with all the details there great thank you so if anybody does have any um any kind of uh, comments or questions that would kind of arise as they often do after these kinds of moments um this is the point where i would normally say let's all adjourn to the pub which is all what my um my uh my experience of academic seminars was when i was doing my phd was all it's time to go to the pub so um um, please um, join me in giving a virtual round of applause to Jonathan for his fantastic talk and join us once more in a fortnight for our next talk, um, details of which are on the DCRC website. Right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone.